let's do some Elixir. In my video about what Elixir is, I outlined three different paradigms that you would have to sort of tackle to work with Elixir, which can be a bit of a challenge. And the first one is functional programming. The second one is the actor model. And the third one is sort of Erlang and OTP itself as a platform. And in this video, I hope to address functional programming. Not all of it, but some of it. So I'm making the assumption that you know some programming and have been exposed to sort of mainstream programming. So that could be Python, PHP, JavaScript, Java, something fairly common. But I'm also making the assumption that you haven't been particularly exposed to functional programming concepts. And that's what we're going to be covering. This will not be your in-depth view of Elixir the language. It will be a tour through what you need to know about functional programming to get started with Elixir. I will run my examples in an IEX session. IEX is the REPL that ships with Elixir. Essentially, it's a terminal where you can write Elixir and get the results. Let's dive in. So the absolute basics will seem very familiar. You can assign things, they keep their values, store that information, and the only difference really is that in Elixir it's called binding, so it's when you change a value, it's not reassigning, it's rebinding. In many mainstream languages, simpler values, usually numbers and maybe strings, are handled in a way where you can actually change them, you can only replace them. So you can't change the number one, you can just generate a new number, which is like if you add one, you get the number two, but you know, then change one to B2. Elixir is like that, but with everything. So in this example, concatenating the strings does not change the value of X in the first attempt. We have to rebind the value to actually change X. Different languages would handle this rather differently, but Elixir handles everything the same. And it's like this, you have to assign it, otherwise you're not changing it. We can see the same thing with the list. We'll use the prepend syntax to add an item to a list. It didn't change. Everything you do in Elixir produces a return value. And you can see that very clearly in IEX, for example, because it prints out a representation of your return value after every executable line. But typically in your programs, you have to take that return value and do something with it, otherwise it's lost. So typically that would be binding it or using it as a return value in your function to pass it on. We can use maps for some fairly clear examples of this. Maps are the dictionaries or associative arrays or JavaScript objects. It's the key value data structure of Elixir and the map module manipulates them. So we can see that there's no change. And there we go. The values are immutable. This means that they do not change unless you change them. And when you change them, you actually replace them. This mostly makes your program easier to reason about, easier to think about, easier to understand, but it can also lead to some real face palmy moments where you just ignore the return value of a function because you're very used to objects, for example, and methods, setters and getters. So an important property of immutability is that it allows you to exclude possibilities. It allows you to make assumptions about what can happen in your program, which makes concurrency and distributed computing easier, not easy, but easier. And this is the foundation for Elixir and Erlang's powerful use of the actor model and why they are functional languages 
that are not just functional for some sort of mathematical purity, but rather to get particular results and particular capabilities and make particular sorts of tasks easier. And next up, we have a thing that Elixir has that will make mainstream programmers much more comfortable and make them feel right at home, sort of. It's a for loop. The loop is a lie. It's not really a loop. Under the hood, it is using what we always use in functional languages to work our way through lists and other enumerables. It's using recursion. It uses recursion because doing a traditional loop requires mutability, and we avoid that. We don't have that. Instead, we have recursion. Now, to make recursion easier to work with, we also have a lot of nice abstractions on top of recursions. You can express recursion very, very gracefully and effectively in Elixir, but we haven't covered the tools and syntax for that yet. So I think we will start with the traditional ways of working your way through a list or a dictionary map in Elixir and in functional languages, which is map and reduce. Reduce is something sometimes called fold in certain functional languages. I never understood that quite, but that's the case. So let's start with map. Elixir provides enum.map, which takes an enumerable, which can be a list, for example, and it also takes a function and it applies that function to every item in the list. And then it returns the new list. Each function should return a changed item or whatever you want, but the new list will be made of the results of calling that function on each item in the enumerable. So let's take a list of strings and call string capitalized on each of them. But hold on, you say, our function here, it's not binding the value of string capitalized. Aren't we just throwing away the result? Why are we getting a result? Well, we defined a function here, and let's not dwell on functions right now, but suffice to say that there is no return keyword in Elixir, so the final expression in the function produces the return value, and in our case, that's string capitalized. Using enum.map and mapping through a collection of items like this is a very useful way of, for example, converting items from one data type to another, from one structure to another, but it can't change the number of items in the collection. To do that, we would need to use a more complex, a more powerful tool. That's enum.reduce. Now there are some ways in the enum module in Elixir to remove items from a list, for example, that at the surface doesn't seem to be as complicated as reduce can be, but they use reduce under the hood because that's how that's how functional programming works. If you want to change what's in a list, you need to reduce it. And under the hood of reduce and map, it's all recursion. Anyway, similarly to enum.map, reduce takes a collection of things. It takes a function to apply to them. It goes through the items and applies the function but it does take an additional thing, which is a value that's called the accumulator. The accumulator is passed into the provided function every time it is called. And instead of returning just a new item, the function is expected to return the new accumulator, the new value for the accumulator. When the entire reduce operation is complete, it has gone through the entire collection, the final accumulator value is what's returned. This allows us to turn a collection of things into essentially anything. And in this case, we took a list of strings and turned it into a number. Now, the enum module in Elixir has a ton of useful tools and I recommend checking it out. We can't cover half of what you can do with 
enumerables and collectibles and uh, all of that here, we'll have to plow bravely forward into conditionals. Typically, you'll have seen if, else, and an occasional switch. Keep that switch in mind, just in case. So this is a pretty typical if statement. The return values I have there with the colons, they're atoms, and I barely know how to explain atoms. Much like a number, take the number one. The number one is a number, it is also itself. An atom is an identifier of some of sorts, a label, I don't know what to call it, but it is an atom and it is itself. So colon strange is just strange. It's not a string, because then it would be a string. It's an atom. Just like everything in Elixir, if statements return things, good thing to keep in mind. Case statements allow you to match against multiple different possible and impossible return values, take an action based on any of those criteria. Here we also apply what's called a guard, guard clause, with the when keyword, which allows us to specify certain types of constraints. So we only accept this number if it is larger than this number. And then we also have an example of matching on a value where we don't care to keep the value. It's essentially a catch-all. We use an underscore. Now this is an example of pattern matching. Pattern matching is an incredibly powerful tool in functional programming, and it made absolutely no sense whatsoever to me the first time I was told about it. But let's move forward and introduce the tuple. The tuple lets you group multiple values. It's not really a list. It's a it should be a few items at most. So pattern matching is a tool that lets you take your data structures, apply a pattern to them and say, oh, I require this, I require that, and I want this piece of data, and I want that piece of data. It's really powerful. And in the first example here, which is a very small example, we match on a two-part tuple, and we require that the first part is the atom count. Then we bind the second part to the variable num, and then we have the number in that variable. The second example, is where we take a two-part tuple still, and we say we want the first item bound to my atom, and we want the second one to exist. We require that it's there, but we don't actually care what it is, and we ignore it entirely. In Erlang, there's a tradition of using OK and arrow tuples as return values, and this is especially used for things that fail fairly often where it's not exceptional that a function call of this type can fail. For example, in Elixir, it's used by file.stats, which allows you to check the status of a file on disk. And the file might not be there. You might not have access to the file. The file might be there, and then you should get a, an OK result. But it's not a weird thing if the file doesn't exist. I mean, it might be weird, but it could also be perfectly normal. You might have spelled it wrong. Using a case statement with the file stat function allows us to match for the successful finding of the file and produce one result or match against a number of different types of errors and produce other results. And finally, we can also capture sort of general errors where we don't care about particulars, but want to make sure that if there's an additional error we didn't expect, we do something nice. A bit of a curiosity in Elixir is that the single equal sign that we use to bind variables is not actually an assignment operator. 
it's a match operator. What it does is that it takes a pattern and it takes an expression and it produces whatever bindings come out of that or an error if the match doesn't work out. What we do when we bind like x equals one is that we say, we'll take anything and bind it to x. We place no pattern restrictions on this assignment or on this match. So now I think we've covered enough conceptual ground and some of the syntax. So now we could actually make an example of recursion. So here we're using a number of things we haven't done before. We're defining a module, we are defining named functions, we are defining private named functions with fp, and we are matching on the head and tail of a list. But in the end, we're taking a list of strings and we're producing cursed atoms. Functional concepts can seem very foreign at first, but they are very useful for helping you manage your data and your state. It's not an accident that many of the popular JavaScript frameworks try to get you to use pure functions to change your state. Now that's a much harder job in JavaScript because immutability is not a thing there, but they do try. This really only scratches the surface of these concepts and it only starts to show how they show up throughout Elixir. If you want to learn more about the language, I would suggest looking at the official Elixir guide, that's where I started, and also Elixir School, which is a complete open curriculum focusing on Elixir. I hope that this has been helpful in sort of clearing some of the hurdles and the conceptual part of tackling the functional aspects of Elixir. This is the very first video that I have a sponsor for. Now, it's an Elixir company, so don't skip ahead, and they are hiring. West Aret, they're an Elixir consultancy in the US, focused on higher education. They're a very value-driven company, and I spoke to their CEO and a number of their developers. They seem like a really nice company, very focused on being a nice place to work. I would suggest that if you are looking to get into Elixir or are looking around for other Elixir-related work, head over to underduo.io slash jobs.html and you can see the postings for their positions and yeah, there, there'll be a link as well. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Stay curious out there.